Greetings, growers worldwide. Jordan River, back at you with more Growcast, hot off the presses. Today, we have Jason Hadley back on the line. This is maybe Jason's strongest episode. We talk about some really cool stuff, not just microbe control, but we go deep into filter science, uh, bacterial communication, and how microbes work with each other and communicate. We talk about biofilm. It's really, really cool. Now, we have a visual resource for you guys to go over, actually several visual resources, you can go to growcastpodcast.com slash microbe control. Microbe control is all one word there. And that'll bring up a free PDF with a, a bunch of graphs and charts and visuals that we will be going over on this episode. So feel free to follow along. We do our best to explain for the audio listeners as well. But take a look at these charts and graphs when you can, because they're really, really cool. And we do go over them in order on air in today's episode. So thank you to Jason for a very, very strong episode. We've got lots of updates. Make sure to stay tuned for the update episodes. We've got two meetups this month on October 30th. We've got Denver and Oklahoma City. So come on out. I'll be at the Oklahoma City one. And we got ones going on all over the country, folks. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Before we jump into it with Jason Hadley, shout out to my good friends, Dino Myco. That's right. DinoMyco.com. Code GROWCAST for 10% off the very unique Dino Myco mycorrhizal fungi that's harvested in vivo in Israel. Very great stuff. Resistant to high salinity. Increase your yields. Increase your plant health. You got to throw that myco in the hole. And uh, why not go to dinomyco.com and use code GROWCAST. We've also got a 20% off code for our members at the Order of Cultivation. You can find our membership at growcastpodcast.com slash membership. And there's a bunch of member discounts. They're back, everybody. We've got several of them up there, including Dino Myco. I just met up with Ari from Dino Myco, and this guy has a real passion for mycorrhizal fungi. And they're producing high quality stuff. They're harvesting it in vivo. It's not your average species of mycorrhizal fungi. And you can find it at dinomyco.com, code GROWCAST for 10% off. And members of the Order of Cultivation getting 20% off at growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Thank you to Dino Myco. Thank you to Ari. He'll be back on the show soon. He'll be on Growcast TV, so stay tuned. But for now, enjoy this awesome show with Jason Hadley. Thank you for listening and enjoy the program. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to tell a friend about Growcast. Turn someone on to growing. Tell a smoker, tell a grower. And of course, um, subscribe to this show and check out all of our action at growcastpodcast.com slash action. There you can find Growcast Seed Co. and the Living Soil Masterclasses and membership uh, and all that. Membership closing its doors January 1st, everybody. Come check it out. Come check it out. Today, we have on the line, actually, a guest who's been featured in membership a few times. You've heard him on this show before as well. He is a microbe control expert. He's a filtration expert. Really awesome guest. Jason from Lighthouse Solutions and Filter is back on the show. What's up, Jason? How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me back, man. I very much appreciate it. Hell yeah, brother. We always like your episodes. Um, microbe control is something that uh, I'm really fascinated in. It gets overlooked a lot, especially in yeah. the home grow world. But um, we've got some really extra special stuff for the listeners today because not only are we going to go over this in audio format, but we also have a bunch of visual aids uh, available for you guys for free. All you got to do to follow along with this episode, if you so choose, is to go to growcastpodcast.com forward slash microbe control, all one word microbe control, growcastpodcast.com slash microbe control will pull up all the uh, charts and graphs and different visual aids that we will be covering during this episode. Now we're going to still do our best to break it down in audio format, but some of these are really, really cool to look at. And again, you can find all of this and follow along for free at growcastpodcast.com slash microbe control. Find the link in the description as well. Now, Jason, it is croptober. We are focusing on the end of flower. We're focusing on dry and cure and this this type of thing. And I'm not sure that yeah. microbe control is ever more important than in late flower. I mean, it's always important, but the last thing you want is to have some sort of pathogen or airborne mold in your garden in late flower. So that's what we're talking about today, right? Preventing that yeah, I would agree. filters and how they work and all of that. I would agree. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, here's the thing. We cannot discount uh, post-harvest contamination. That's probably the point where, dare I say, the plant's more like at its most vulnerable, because, I mean, think about the factors that are going into play here. Like once you go through chop, right, you have 
a lot more hands that are handling it. So, and, and all it was doing before was sitting in a pot or a cube, minding its own business, maybe getting a few leaves plucked here and there. But now, now they're, you know, the girls are getting a little roughed up. And <laughs> with all of the change of hands in the chop process, all of the change of hands in hanging and drying, let's not even get started on all the hands that get put on that product in, in trim, you know, in the trim environments. So you have that factor going as well. You also kind of have the, like these flower spaces sort of start to develop their own microbiome where a microbiome uh, is basically just sort of the, the little ecosystem of microbes that are developing in there in the soils and then the plants and then the surfaces. Because what's happening is it, it was like nestled in this like wonderful, perfect temperature, awesome and ideal condition that it was flourishing in. And then you're, chopping it down and you're now subjecting everything that's riding on that or everything that's inside of that to like another area of a process where now there's different environmental factors, there's different microbial pressures that are in there. So there's a lot of exposure. And then like on the third side of it, and just at the most basic level is that you're killing a plant, right? I mean, unfortunately, but you know, in many cases you're, you're killing the plant. So by that process, it jump starts the decomposition process. Mm, sure. That's the kickoff for plants decomposing. And what happens? How do plants decompose? Plants decompose by getting broken down. By what? Well, molds, for example. Bacteria, fungi, and it's really right. good. At, it's really good at calling those things in. Exactly. And um, you know, some of them may even be present but just not get activated until necrosis occurs. You know, oh, good point. There's that factor as well. You know, I mean, let's be real. We're growing, you know, fly paper that gets you high, right? So a lot of, <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot if you of do it right, you grow on it. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm really excited to get into all of this, man. Now we're going to start with uh, filters, and we're going to get into some filter uh, specifics and the nitty gritty for you growers out there. This is really interesting stuff, and then we're going to move on to surface cleaning. And a lot of that hand washing stuff, man, you must just be driven insane looking at people shaking hands in public oh, and all yeah. the fucking things they do. It's like that movie. What's the mm -hmm. movie where he puts on the glasses and he can see the fucking monsters that are all around? <laughs> right, him. right, right. No, no, yeah, that, that equipment unfortunately exists under you know the right lighting and, <laughs> and chemical conditions. But yeah, they do those types of tests all the time where they let 50 people into a room like to have like a lunch buffet. And then they hit it with a black light and they find all the just gnarliness all over the place. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's what we're, that's what we're aiming to control everybody. That's what we're aiming to control. For and, sure. um, I mean, you work for a company called filter F I L T R, mm -hmm. but, um, yes. you know, you, you specialize in, in filters and I want to get into some filter science. That's where I want to start, man. The first, Absolutely. Um, let's do it. The first graphic on this little sheet that you've, uh, you've put together for us is the dust carrier particle size. Now, this is really cool to see a, a visual representation of. And what it's showing right. for the audio listeners is a big circle that is the dust particle. And it shows the size of that dust particle. It looks like a dust particle can anywhere be, uh, be anywhere from a half a micron to 500 microns. So this is probably a medium-sized dust particle. It's the center of this image, and it's a big orb. Well, riding on the side of this thing is a bacteria and it looks like that's, you know, it's just a fraction of the size and a virus is even smaller riding on that. So, so we imagine these things free floating, but what you're telling me is dust can carry, they can carry each other. All sorts of different vectors can come from airborne particles. Absolutely. I mean, things, you have to think at high concept in nature that things ride on the backs of things that ride on the backs of things like you and I, and everyone listening to this right now at this very second we all have what's called a demodex in our eyelids. It lives in the roots of our eyelashes. It is an insect. You know what I mean? Our skin is alive with all sorts of bacteria and what have you. So dust particles carrying other things is, is totally a thing. I mean, I have like microscopic photos or photos of microscopic pollen with, that have powdery mildew riding on it. So you have to remember that like at that size scale, if you want to kind of envision what that particle looks like imagine just a grain of sand at a beach but a very very tiny one you know what i mean like so small that like 40 of them could stack on top of each other and still not see over the ridge of your fingerprint like that small mm. and uh, so these dust particles you know they do um attract uh, particles in some cases it's like a direct impact and in some cases it's more like an electrostatic attraction 
and we'll cover all of this too in, in the filtration side because we use those same methodologies against the problem as well. But you know, I, I, there are plenty of studies out there that that show that like desert dust in the Mojave Desert, you know, carries uh, Aspergillus niger spores along with it as it goes through the air. And you have to remember that at their scale, at that dust particle size, mold spore size scale. You know, us whispering is like a category five hurricane to the particle. Right. So in some cases, depending on the size of the particle, they can remain aloft in the air almost indefinitely until they find something to like attract to or stick to or lodge into or whatever. They're just continually rolling around. I would imagine that it like, you know, thank goodness for human evolution and not being able to see down to that level because we can only the, the human eye can only see down to like maybe 35 to 50 microns. But if you could see all of the particles that are in your room right now, you probably wouldn't be able to see your hand in front of your face. You'd be blind. Yeah, totally. Right. That's crazy to think about. Yeah. And trying to wrap my head around these sizes again, referring to this chart, bacteria yeah. clocking in at 0.2 microns to two microns. And yeah, then viruses. Up to about five, yeah. Viruses are way small. Holy way, shit. way, way, way small. Like coronavirus, that analogy of like being able to stack on top of each other to see over the ridge of your fingerprint, right? Coronavirus, you would be stacking, I think, like 2,000 and something. I did the math one time. Jeez. That's how tiny these things are. Yeah. This chart saying that 0. 0.006 mm -hmm. microns up to 0. 0.03 microns. Yep. So. That's 3% of a micron. That's insane. Yeah. And not only that, but so, so there's also like on the commercial scale and even in, in the, in the patient level caregiver, you know, caregiver scale as well. I mean, you have to remember that there's so much concern for plant health that there's not always concern for people health. And in these areas, you have like a lot of, uh, a lot of people working together. Like I just talked to a client the so other day, true. they were running my filter in their trim room during coronavirus because work still had to get done and they didn't have a single case of COVID out of their trim room throughout COVID. They used the same crew. Now, hold on a second. <laughs> you better be careful let me, let me, with these me, claims. Let me, let me. Are you telling me that it, it can stop viruses, a filter that small? Well, yeah. Hepa, I mean, because here's the thing that you have to consider. Viruses don't travel in air very well on their own. So usually they have to hitch on to a dust particle or a respirable water droplet from a cough or a sneeze or something like that. That's the thing that you inhale. The virus just happens to be inside it. So in fact, when it comes down to filtration, like you don't have to necessarily capture the virus. You have to capture the things that virus particles will, will ride along with. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So like you that makes sense. Like, yeah, I mean, same thing with bacteria. Bacteria don't travel very well in the air on their own either. They they rely on being on something like a cookie crumb or something like that. You know what I mean? So and I'm only saying this because, you know, I'm, cookies sound amazing. Right now. <laughs> you're hungry. I can tell you're hungry. <laughs> so think of the dust, the bacteria. Think, think of the dust like a big cookie, a big pie that we cut up into, right, right. into no, pork slices, yeah, all for me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and some milk, some ice cold milk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but in, you know, to snap it back to the subject here, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, they were able to continue. They just ran filter. Like, I, I remember even in my training, when I was sitting there talking to like one of the developing guys, I'm like, you mean to tell me that if AIDS goes airborne, that like the safest room to be in would be one with a filter. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we, that's what we're saying. And, you know, that's this is I know what that's, Jason thinks about. This is a bold claim. I get it. But you have to remember that Filter and Lighthouse, like Lighthouse is just celebrating its 40th year in business. And we've been serving pharmaceutical clean rooms and semiconductor manufacturing clean rooms and automotive clean rooms. And damn, these, these very these areas where the particle counts are so low that like it's like comparable to working in space, you know, depending on like where when you're talking about those big like bio level four suits, you know, the big yellow ones that make you look like a big yellow minion, you know, those kind of suits. Like, yeah, totally. You know, I mean, we supply the particle counters for the Pentagon, you know, for detecting airborne particle threats, because when you're trying to make an anthrax or something like that, you want to make it as small of a particle as possible. So that Holy way it has fuck, dude. Right, oh yeah, for sure. Because you want your bio weapon. Sorry, we got into a depressing topic, but your no, bio that's weapon, just. I didn't know you provided the Pentagon. That's fucking cool. But please continue. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It, trust me, it can, creates all these conflicts in working with the cannabis industry <laughs> because we're, we're 
were audited and all this stuff, but that's a whole other discussion for another show. But, <laughs> but no, but in all seriousness, you want to make your anthrax particle as small as possible so that it bypasses all of the body's natural filters right. and gets into the deeper part of your lungs and into your bloodstream and then infects you. So at the Pentagon, if they get an abnormal reading, they start looking around Did a helicopter take off or is there a forest fire nearby? And if not, then Whoa. they start shutting down parts of the Pentagon. And then they bring in all the big sniffer equipment, the super sniffer equipment that can try to figure out what's going on. That's a you know? trip, man. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it goes way deep. <laughs> so, so with regard to like, you know, making sure that you're keeping particles out of your grow environment, you know, you really do want to deploy as much air filtration as possible. And there are a lot of competing technologies, you know, I mean, so I sell air filtration. It's a HEPA air filter. It is, not sexy, I'll be the first to admit, because air goes in, you know, dirty air goes in, clean air comes out. It's a super simple process. There's other devices and other technologies that I would never knock them as a competitor, but what I will say is that I can make a case that they're not the most ideal for use in cannabis, including stuff like UV, PCO, that airborne hydrogen peroxide. There's a lot of like pros and cons around that sort of stuff, and they were great for the industries that they serve. You know, like AeroClean sure. 420, for example, came out of uh, keeping tomatoes from uh, ripening on the way to market. So if I need someone to get rid of my ethylene rotting gases, my ripening gases, they're my first call. If I need to keep my ice machine clean at a restaurant, you know, Pyridime is my first call. But I would not put a HEPA filter in an ice maker. You know what I mean? Like this, this, it's the right tool for the right job. And so you have to consider that these cannabis environments, you're best served living somewhere between food production standards at the bottom end and pharma production standards at the top end. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, the, the need, especially with, with re, listen, it's really state microbe compliance that's driving this because you have to be able to pass the test at the end of the crop and they don't do product safety testing at any point along the way. So I have to advocate to my clients, not even just, just talking to them about a filter. I need to talk about the entire facility or the entire grow as a whole. You know what I mean? Because I am just one piece in a larger machine of keeping microbes under control so that you can get past the test and make money off your product. Right. I totally understand, man. Then, it, you know, it's kind of it's a little bit fucked up that you say food safety on the bottom end, but that's how mm -hmm. we have it in this country, right? That's unfortunately yeah. how it goes. And it seems like cannabis with the regulations can fall all over the place, depending on what market you're in. Right. Well, so, but that's the thing is that they just, they, 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 they basically put like a barbed wire finish line on a race to get to the end of the line. <laughs> you you so know true. what I mean? So that's the whole thing. There's nothing really short of like a couple of States that are mandating like LED lighting, like Massachusetts mandates LED lighting. Sure. Because, but that's more of like a carbon footprint measure more so than, you know, th there's not a lot of regulation state to state that tells you how you have to engage in your process. They just tell you what the result of your work has to be. Yeah. And what you can't have on your fucking. Right. Right. Yeah. What you can't have on it. Exactly. So with that being said, it's like, you have to look to industries that are operating already that are already operating at higher and cleaner standards. And, you know, I get it. Like, it sounds like it's making more work and nobody got into this business to do a bunch of work. They just didn't want to work a day job. Right. <laughs> don't want, don't <laughs> want to work a nine to five, end up working 24 uh, right, seven. That's, right, that's exactly. the grower lifestyle. A hundred percent. Yep. Anyone who's been mopping a flood on Thanksgiving, delaying the whole family's meal, I've, I've been there, bro. Exactly. And, and you know what? Live by the bud, die by the bud. I wouldn't have it any other way myself, whether it's podcasting or growing. But um, but yeah, sure. I, I totally agree. But back to this HEPA filtration technology. This is yes. what you sell. This is what you're all about. What right. What is the difference between MERV and HEPA? Or is MERV like a rating? What, what does MERV yeah. mean? Okay. So MERV is, uh, stands for Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value. And so what the MERV scale is, is it is a standardized scale so that you can have an expectation of the performance of your filter. So they give it a number designation and it's, and that number designation is based on how much of a particular size particle it can capture. So for example, to look at the, the MERV chart that I included here, like Let's mm -hmm. say like most like houses and office spaces are operating at like a MERV 8 air filter. 
right? That's what their system's going. So if you look at the chart, it's broken down by three columns, particles that are 0.3 to one micron, one micron to three microns, and three to 10 microns, right? Right. So the, like a MERV-8 filter is going to capture less than 20% of 0.3 to 1 micron, or it's going to capture so, uh, less than 20% of 1 to 3 microns, and it's going to get about 60 or 70 to 85% of anything 3 microns and above. Which, And you're like, well, what's the difference between 3 microns and above? So we're talking like larger mold spores, um, like cooking dust, like aerosolized oils, uh, hairspray droplets um, on this chart it mentions furniture polish at the mervay scale but we're also talking like certain pet hairs and danders and skin flakes and so you know. pretty big stuff and it looks like the mervay ones are like your average run-of-the-mill filters yeah exactly so then you contrast that with like a merv 13 filter for example and for one micron and up it's going to catch 90 percent or more right Right. So, I mean, granted, you know, you still have like 10 percent of your dust that's being filtered out is going to go back into the environment. And what is that dust? Again, it's a mixture of dirt particles. It's a mixture of mold spores, pollens, you know, stuff like that. And then whatever's hitching rides on that stuff. That is so, so crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in commercial facilities, if you're running like a MERV 13 air filtration, you're doing great. That's a great start. But here's the thing that, that, that um, you know, more like patient and caregiver level grows might need to be aware of is that your air conditioning system does not specify which MERV filter goes with your air conditioner. They're not going to take that level of liability and say that this is this takes MERV 8, you know. So what they leave it to the consumer hmm. to size the filter themselves. So, you know, it works within a range, right? So, like, let's say... You're running MERV 8, well, you want to step up to a MERV 10, where now you're catching like 50% or better of one micron particles. You know, the performance of your air conditioner will top out if your filter media is too thick. Because remember, all the mechanical parts are still having to force air through now what is a thicker media. Right. So just to kind of sway anyone from just running out to like a place and jamming a 13 into a unit that takes an 8, you know, number one, the filter size probably won't fit, but that, you know, because it's just a thicker media and a thicker filter box. But let's say you were able to jam it in there. You could potentially experience a huge drop off in your cooling sure. capacity. Your mechanical parts would be overworking and thus lower the product life cycle of your air conditioning unit. So that's where filter comes into play because we're a supplemental air filter. All we attack is the particle problem. We work completely independent of your HVAC, you know, so you would just basically mount us, hang us, roll us into a room and uh, turn it on. And then it's just immediately going to be starting to continually Jeez. exchange air within the room. Holy fuck, man. Now, let me ask you this. I, mm -hmm. I see that up, up at the top here, when you get up to MERV 17 rating and more, you enter the HEPA territory. It says HEPA 13 and HEPA 14. Correct. Does that mean that every time I see HEPA at the fucking target that it's that mm -hmm. rating or are there inferior Correct. HEPA filters as well? Well, I mean, let me put it this way. You know, you, you have like McDonald's and you have fine dining, right? But they're both food. So yes, there are certain standards that, that have to be met from a minimal standpoint, but HEPA is a designated rating, a performance rating. Right. So basically with HEPA, if you're labeling it HEPA and you're standing by your claim and your claim is valid, that means for every 10,000 particles that go through into your filter, only three of them come out. Wow. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, as as unfortunately as consumers, we don't have the equipment and oftentimes the knowledge to be able to validate the performance to make sure that the HEPA I'm buying at Target is actually, in fact, a bona fide HEPA. You know, we have to sort of put some trust in the manufacturer that there's that they're selling us that. And, you know, we know how that can go sometimes. So, I mean, if growers out in grow world and you're among your audience are like looking to start talking about like devices that filter air and stuff like that, it is super important to uh, reach out to the manufacturer and see if they have, you know, any kind of product testing data or validation studies or what have you. Something that speaks to the idea that, that they can validate that their HEPA is manufactured and in fact follows sure. that standard. Because here's the other thing, the HEPA itself, the HEPA itself might be a HEPA filter. Like, 
if you were to just put it in any old device or just run air through it, it can perform as a HEPA. But depending on the manufacturing method of the device itself, there is what is called a leak rate, L-E-A-K, right? Oh, like a leak, yeah. Right? And so what can happen is, is when like poorly and mass manufactured HEPA filters go on the market, not all of the air that is being taken into that device is going out to the filter. So you don't necessarily have a complete efficiency because the device itself is not al- is is allowing air to escape through other means beyond just through the HEPA filter. Right, right. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. So that's where, like, you know, during the COVID craze, for example, you couldn't find a HEPA filter on Amazon. But like you didn't really know if they were working because they were so cheaply and mass manufactured. And in fact, we pulled a few off the market and we tested them and found out that, yes, we could detect leaks. How do you detect leaks? You may be asking uh, with a particle counter. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we manufacture particle counters and other clean room monitoring tools. And a particle counter is literally, as it says, it counts particles in the air, takes a sample of the air and churns that into a number of varying micron sizes. It breaks it down, sizes it and counts it. It's a technical device. But once you learn, once you understand it, you know what you're looking at. And so I, I all the time, like at MJ BizCon that's coming up here, you know, I walk around with a filter and put a particle counter on the bottom end, put the particle counter on the top end. And I can literally demonstrate in real time that this thing is filtering air. <laughs> that's crazy, man. I right. love it. That, and those particle counters are available at, at your website. What is that website? Yeah, uh, it's uh, golighthouse.com, www.golighthouse.com. Nice. And and they're, they're you know, particle counters are, are fantastic for being able to sniff problems out of the air. So let's say the air, you're continually recirculating air in your space. A particle counter should be able to validate that, like, you have uh, a reduced particle count from before you started running the filter. But here's the other thing that can happen is that particle counters are fascinating because what they do is they show you what normal air looks like. So normal air has a very high volume of tiny, tiny particles and a lower volume of larger particles because those larger particles fall out of the air, right? They fall to the floor. So Think about it in terms of a beach, right? You go to the beach and it's just covered in sand, right? Covered in sand. Those are your tiny, tiny particles. And then you start to like, you know, see the little tiny stones and then you see the larger rocks and then you get to the boulders and you know what I mean? So that's kind of the size difference that you're talking Mm -hmm. about. So what a particle counter can tell you is if there is something in the air that shouldn't be there. So For instance, you know, when you start to know, you learn to read these devices and you see that like you should have a lower volume of 10 micron particles than five micron particles. But if you have a higher amount, it means that that's outside. It deviates from what normal air should be. And it implies that something is pushing particles into the space. What is that? What is that particle then? Is that particle, is it drywall dust? Is it a mold spore outbreak? And so that's where you would then want to sample your air. When take it, put it on a Petri dish, you know, and then like we make devices that sample air at a very specific interval. You could set a plate, uh, a little Petri dish out on a surface and then cap it and send it. There's a, there's a variety of different ways, but you send that to a lab and they can tell you within a few days who exactly is at the party in your air. Yeah, man, that would be really, really fascinating to see. I know I've grown in spaces before that just were not conducive to gardening. And I wonder how much had to do with the house and like the air and the mold and and all of that. Yeah, I mean, because remember, you're being tasked with eliminating something that has been around for 450 million years and is persistent and is an opportunist and is everywhere. We breathe them out and exhale mold spores all the time. Yep, it's kind of All frightening, and like you said, it could have started life on Earth, and now we have to battle them. But that's why we I need filters, you know, that's, Dude, at the end of the day. A, it is a tortured world I live in, man, because I can't eat birthday cake after someone blows the candles off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I mean, it's a tortured world to live in. I'm, I got to admit, knowing what I know and seeing what I see, I'm like, ah. It's pretty and then, funny of course, stuff, my man. yeah, and my two year old wants to feed me a goldfish, and if I don't take that goldfish <laughs> from her in that hand that I have no idea where it's been. Yeah, exactly. Fun times. Anyway. It'll make you stronger, man. Trust me. I, I just lean right, into it. Right. Just lean into it. But exactly. let's go on to something that'll make us feel a little bit better. Sure. 
We'll be right back with Jason, everybody. But before that, the Foop. That's right. Croptober sale going on. Amazon Prime Day is here, and Foop is rolling out a killer sale for it. It's already going, everybody. You can find all their products, pretty much all their products, are 20% off and free shipping. It's all on Amazon Prime if you want that Prime delivery, and you can find that at Amazon.com slash Foop. You can also find on their website the same deal, thefoop.com. They have 20% off as well as free shipping. So whatever you like, they've got different products up on the website. You know, they've got some gallon packs that aren't available on Amazon. Those are 20% off too. Now you're probably thinking I got to pay shipping. Absolutely not. It's free shipping for the rest of this Croptober sale. And it ends October 18th at midnight. So get in on it, everybody. Foop is doing Amazon Prime Day early. They're doing the Croptober sale. You can find it all at thefoop.com. 20% is already live there and amazon.com com slash foop if you prefer that while supplies last we love the foop get that fish shit flavor everybody i'm using it on this run my plants are happy as fuck and the october sale runs until october 18th at midnight enjoy that croptober spectacular the foop.com amazon.com slash foop and get after it everybody be healthy go organic use foop all right let's get back to it with jason Let's go on to something that'll make us feel a little bit better. Um, sure. Taking a look at this this graph of the mechanisms of filtration, you talk about these particles. Let's talk about okay. how they act and how they act when they hit the filter. What can you tell us about this this kind of chart that shows these particles approaching mm-hmm. two spheres, what I assume is the filter, and the different yeah. ways that it gets kind of disabled or sucked in or whatever you call it? Right. So the orange circles are sort of a cross-section of the HEPA fiber. So... To understand what a HEP, what a HEPA filter is made out of, it's I, it's not all that different than like your average like pleated filter and what have you. It's just that the fibers that are shot together and woven together to make the HEPA are very 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 small fibers, like uh, half of uh you know anywhere from like a half to like one and a half microns. Sure. So the idea being that like if you had, I use the analogy when I kind of speak from uh, of to HEPA versus like other like kill technologies like UV and PCO and stuff like that. I'd say it like this. If you had a cloud of baseballs that were flying towards you from center field to home plate, would you try to knock them out of the air with another cloud of baseballs or would you just go stand behind the backstop and let that do all the work? <laughs> sure. Right. Okay. So that said, taking that kind of visual in mind, so this, th- what you're looking at is um, a cross-section of these filters, and the blue arrows are showing the airflow that is, that is going through the filter media, and then the green is the particle and the path of the particle itself. So if you think about like basically like a fishing net, except the net holes are all chaotic and unevenly sized and woven together, and there's multiple layers of them, right? These particles will enter this filter media and a couple of things will happen. There's what's called uh, seething or sieving, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And that's basically where where a particle gets lodged between, gets caught between two uh, filter fibers, much like when you're straining pasta, Right. right? Same concept. Then there is what's called interception, which is uh, when the particle path sort of glances off of it or it is it is turned into the fiber. There's also inertial impaction, which is like a direct head-on particle to fiber impact. And And it stays there? there. It sticks there. Yes. Right. And even if it jostled loose, there's still other fibers for it to directly impact onto. Right. Now, just for clarity's sake, sieving, interception, inertial, like direct impaction, those are things that are happening at like, say, like a half a micron and up. Mm -hmm. And then... Or maybe, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, maybe, yeah, one, three microns, three microns and up. I have, we have another chart that we'll get to. I'm kind of going from memory. But the reason I bring this up is because HEPA filters will also capture very, very, very tiny particles that are in that one micron, half micron bacterial size range. Mm-hmm. They just do it in a different way. And so there's two concepts. One is called diffusion or Brownian motion. Um, This is the one that's like the hardest to explain because it's basically like a chaos theory where you throw enough stuff at it, it'll get caught in there. Just like through random motion. Like if you've ever seen like- motion. This is some sort of law of physics. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And it's basically like, I mean, here, in fact, actually, let me see if I can- it's, it is defined as the erratic random movement of microscopic particles in a fluid as a result of continuous bombardment from molecules of the surrounding medium. 
so basically, like I mentioned, it is kind of like that chaos theory. And that's where like those particles are small enough to be affected by like molecules. Right. So, you know, it, they're constantly bumping into stuff. And so that's where I was saying, like, if you ever watch like deep sea documentaries and you see the camera, like, you know, going through the water and you see all those little dots and specks just randomly floating around, right. that shit happens in air too, not just in water. Okay. Okay. So those will make their way over time to the fibers. Now, here's the cool thing is that for plant pathogens, you don't have to worry about Brownian motion because when it comes to plant pathogens, your smallest particle threat to your plants is one micron and up so brownian motion is cool just to know like how it works and how it affects and how it integrates with a filter with a hepa filter but sieving interception direct inertial impaction are going to be the uh actual mechanisms of filtration that apply to the to the shit we care about to the larger stuff <laughs> right right and then there's this last um part that uh this last way of of uh, the way filter captures through electrostatic attraction so that is what I think it's the Van der Waal effect is the scientific name for anybody in case it comes up on trivia night. <laughs> That's when you like, you know, that from when you were a kid and you rubbed a balloon on your hair uh, and then you put it on a wall and it stuck. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that same thing. So it's just a tr literally attracted to the fiber and, and magnetically. Uh -huh, exactly. You ever pull a ball. Electrostatically. A, a, a yeah. Yeah. You pull a sock off of a towel out of the dryer. That happens. Electrostatic, and, and, and so that's just another way for it to filter the particle. That's Correct. crazy, man. Correct. I th all this yeah, going on every time, you know, every time a, a draft of air is carried through this filter. That's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 it's designed to continually and aggressively recirculate this air, just as what's done in clean rooms. So the reason clean rooms are clean rooms is because they filter as much of their own air as possible. They try to have as little makeup air as possible, and uh, so they create dead spaces in their walls in order to send air back up to the top where it go, then goes through the fan filter units again. This filter stuff is just insane, man. Like you said, it's a simple concept, but right. you guys spend your whole life, you know, 40 years, this company has been working and, you know, optimizing this filtration mm -hmm. technology is fucking crazy. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, like the bulk of that 40 years admittedly was in monitoring systems and particle counting and air sampling. But, you know, the owner of the company had a vision of releasing a pharmaceutical grade uh, commercial sized air purifier that could be used in businesses. And this was before COVID. We, you know, and ironically, we were the only unit to come down in price in COVID. <laughs> I mean, if you want to know the truth, like we actually we lowered our prices at that time and, and have held that price since. But that said, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's it is applying everything that is happening in a pharmaceutical environment so there are two standards if anybody ever wanted to google them one is 21 cfr part 211 that's the code of federal regulations and in effect 21 cfr part 211 is the is the uh standards for creating finished pharmaceuticals so it talks about having hepa air filtration and those types of things mm -hmm. there's also another set of standards called the usp the u.s pharmacopoeia and that's what a lot of the states base their testing standards off of, because the U.S. Right. pharmacopoeia already had a microbe tolerance thing in there for like supplements and nutraceuticals and stuff like that. So a lot of them just sort of adopted that. And that mentions HEPA 36 times. <laughs> well, there you go, man. I think that yeah. really it boils down to two main things, which is that that air filtration and then what you alluded to earlier, which is like the handling of these products and in your actual hands and, and how that applies. Would you say those mm -hmm. are the two most important things to think about as a grower? Yeah, I would say I would completely agree that air filtration or, or, or problems arrive in your air and they are oftentimes transported by your hands. Right. You know, there's a lot of high touch surfaces and think about like the guy, the plant that got touched at the beginning of the chop is the cleanest plant in the in the crop. <laughs> oh boy. Right? Hasn't had a chance to cross contaminate touching all yeah, those exactly, you know different right? sticky like you said fly traps these ladies with all their uh, all their dust particles and everything captured on them. Yeah. You know and you're also bringing stuff into the garden. Uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time to cover mm -hmm. everything that oh, goes yeah, by sorry. by yeah. hand you know by hand contamination. This this hand vector, hand washing all this stuff. Here we go. So your scissors, even if you're applying gloves in an unsafe manner and you're contaminating the outsides of your gloves, you want to like really touch the insides of your gloves more than the outside if you can, uh, if you can. 
Um, hand sanitizing before you apply gloves just to, for that added extra step. Uh, commonly touch surfaces like your door handles, the carts that are moving uh, material around. Uh, oh, let's not forget if you take a cell phone break in the middle of working and you got to tell your girlfriend you got to call her back, you just touched your phone and your phone has on average 10,000 microbes per square inch. Ooh. No, I'm sorry, 25,000 microbes per square inch. Your phones hands, are your filthy. Bare, phones are gross. Where do we take them? The bathroom, right? So, you know, your E. coli's and your, and your staff and your uh, salmonellas are going to be a lot more of like the touch transfer and your mold spores and stuff like that are going to be more of your your airborne particles. But, uh, but even still, there's a lot going on, you know, proper hand washing, dude, is essential. And a lot of people wash their hands, but they don't know how to properly wash your hands. So there is actually literally something called the aseptic hand washing technique. And I know your listeners will get a copy of that, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's 100%. in effect, it is a very sectioned and specific way of being able to wash your hands to make sure you have complete coverage. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of silly when you think about it. When you look at this, this is a very comprehensive hand washing technique. Right. And uh, along with that is like this breakdown of missed areas on your hands. You know, you just have oh, some yeah. fucking shit on your fingernail and you're touching the buds that are about to go out to patients. <sighs> yes, I don't exactly, need any exactly. of that contamination, man. Yeah. And our thumbs, the undersides of our fingernails, our finger cuticles, our fingertips. You know, I because I observe, I go to these facilities and I observe, you know, I'm like, let me just look around and see what's going on. I'll watch them, I'll watch them washing their hands. And, you know, I listen, I applaud the effort. You know what I mean? Like, don't get me wrong. That's a huge step, right? If you've ever worked in an office environment with somebody who you heard a toilet flush and then didn't hear running water afterwards, you're just like, yeesh. You know? <laughs> like, no, don't do that. Yeah, the don't coffee the pot, button. the coffee pot handle never gets washed, man. No one ever oh, washes yeah. the coffee pot handle. Right, right. Ugh. And and so you can swab that and see what that's all about if you want, but <laughs> I'll I'll save you the time. It's gross. But yeah, I mean there's a there's a lot of uh, misconceptions in hand washing and and despite people's best efforts and best intentions, there is a way to do that in a more complete fashion. And that's the same you can apply that same uh methodology to hand sanitizer as well. Right. And, and then you're touching surfaces and and things are getting on surfaces and in the grow, there's a lot of dirt. Right. Um, I like this one, this one graphic showing, you know, mold and bacteria under dirt, which is kind of the whole point of a soil grow is to keep that mold and bacteria in your dirt nice and happy. But if it's on a surface, right. uh, that dirt can protect the mold and bacteria in these pathogens and shelter it. Absolutely true. A lot of people, when they like reset an area for the next cycle, you know, again, best intentions, nothing but love. I get it. We're used to seeing wax on, wax off type cleaning because the things that are being cleaned at a restaurant are not as a threat to the human body as the things you need to clean that are a threat to your plants. You need that deeper clean. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you need a different clean because you're trying to kill different stuff. So, for example, our body has naturally has a, a tolerance and an immunity against mold spores and bacteria and stuff like that. But like restaurants have one level of clean that they need to abide by through the county board of health right right and that's just enough to be able to make sure that you don't get sick from their food exactly it's like we were saying earlier right? the, the food standards the food supply standards and the eating standards for some reason in this mm -hmm. country man <laughs> something else yeah it is something else. well it's largely ruled by the manufacturers and you know we can get into socio-political capitalistic types of things where lobbyists can buy you know like buy politicians and that's how policy gets changed because yep. ask me about how i had to shop for baby food and i couldn't buy anything with carrots or sweet potatoes yeah. and most of the baby food is made with carrots and sweet potatoes oh man you know I've what I mean? some crazy baby food reports about yeah and right it's, it's sad that's it. what i'm saying how do you get away with that and it's crazy that cannabis growers are like well like <laughs> we, we, we hold this to our high standards. That's how much we love this plant. Right. But a lot of us grow our own fruits and vegetables too. So shout out to everybody growing their own garden, man. That is the answer. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but, it, and you know, the, the body has ways to take care of a lot of that, like natural, like stuff that comes in on plants. You know what I mean? A lot oh, yeah. of the, when you see romaine pulled off the shelf, it's not necessarily that the romaine crop was poisoned in the ground as much as the handling of it created a situation where there was an outbreak. Right. Why is that? Why is lettuce the one that always gets us sick? That's a good question to answer. Yeah, maybe I'm going to Google that one. I'll, I'll get back nebulous. to you on that ch uh, chat. No, no, I, I know the answer to this. I mean, you know, but I'm just trying to phrase like how it happens. So you have to remember that like 
there are pesticides that are sprayed on plants and in the in the agriculture and the reason that we can spray those things on agriculture and out in the field and we can't spray them in our gardens is because a lot of times those pesticides break down under uv light Hmm. so they're designed to dissipate before harvest and in some cases like with a head of lettuce you're not getting the pesticide down into the heart of the romaine Right. You know, it's just blanketing the top right now. Great. And I'm not an expert on pesticide application, but, you know, my gut is telling me that, like, they're not spraying into the center of every head of lettuce in the ground. I just don't believe that. Right. So we, you have that process of it naturally thriving. I'm sure there's some sort of washing process and kill step involved, but most food is in a constant state of decay. It's just, is it beyond a level that your immune system can handle? So... Imagine how many other people got sick from romaine lettuce that didn't report it. Right. And then how many people got sick or how many people ate romaine lettuce and their a body was able to process it like there they was didn't nothing get wrong sick. Right? Yeah. Good and they point. didn't get sick. Right, 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 right. So, you know, we start to get into product recalls and all that stuff. Like cannabis is way young on that. And that's a Oof. whole other podcast. I've only seen a few. But- yeah. I've only seen a few of those. Very interesting subject, though. Some, some moldy pre-rolls. Oh, getting, yeah. Yeah. That sort of thing. Right. So, so kind of back to the surface area, mm-hmm. you know, so a lot of people have to realize that, you know, it's not just about clean, you got to clean surface dirt and then apply your disinfectants. Because as you mentioned that like surface dirt is very good at hiding uh, mold, you know, you know, the other place that mold hides is in your lines, in your, in your uh, irrigation yes, for uh, sure. setup, you know? And so I, I don't know if that might be maybe nice, a nice transition into the biofilm slide. Yeah, absolutely. This check out this biofilm slide um, in the resources here that we've provided. And what you're looking at here is the life cycle of biofilm. So you see the different stages for the audio listener. Mm-hmm. There's a surface and it starts with like small bacteria that then aggregate and bloom and then grow into a little form. And then by step four, it's like this kind of hulking mass of biofilm formation. And then in five, it bursts open and restarts the cycle. Yeah. So, so here, I'll, I'll, let me try to paint a picture as well. So I'll do my best Morgan Freeman, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. <laughs> bacteria make their way through. No. Uh, okay. So, so bacteria, bacteria have like, you know, they got like those little tails and they swim in water and stuff like that. Right. And so they find a surface that's suitable to them. They drop the tails and then they go into the manufacture of what's called an extracellular matrix. So bacteria are able to make a home for themselves by secreting a fluid that protects them and keeps them safe and provides them a nutrient source. And then other bacteria find this and glom onto it. And then it starts to get bigger because they're producing extracellular uh, matrix, if you will. And so then it starts to grow and more, and then they reproduce inside of that until it reaches a point where the capacity is, is exceeded. And that's when it'll burst open. And then all those bacteria that have been produced within that bubble will then be re-released in order to find new places to root and start biofilm bubbles of their own. Wow. And that's exactly yeah. right. It seems like there's a lot of um, this microbial slime with the, the biofilm. It seems to be an amalgam of different microorganisms. And like you said, bacteria is right. one of those families. But you're right. It looks like it's bubbling up and then bursting. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Not only that, but this is how crazy the circle of life is, man, is that more than one species of bacteria can be in a biofilm. Right. And not only that, but to a certain degree, they've been able to determine that they can actually communicate with each other, even if they're not the same species. Whoa, that's crazy. Yeah. Right. So like there's a certain level of like language capability that all these that these bacteria have. So it's sort of the equivalent of like if you went to Europe and you spoke French, you could conceivably go to Italy and get by, right? Because they're they're both Latin Romance languages, Jeez. a lot of the, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so imagine if all bacteria spoke Latin, but then they specified that they're French or they're Italian or, you know, other Romance languages, but, you know. They can Portuguese. communicate, but they can tell they're communicating it only in certain ways. Right, right, right. That's but crazy. It, let me put it. It's enough for them to work together to continue infecting the insides of your water lines. And then that bacteria that bursts through, if it doesn't find a new place to root, it makes its way into your, uh, into your grow media. And in, in some, yeah, in some cases, those bacteria are cool. You know, I mean, bacteria just doing what bacteria do. There is something called beneficial bacteria, right? 
Oh yeah. But there's also stuff your plants don't want, like fusariums and you know, which is more of a mold. But oh yeah, you know, no, and it, actually looking at these bacteria in this chart, those mm-hmm. little like um kind of long kernel headed sperm looking things with the tails. Right. That actually looks right. like a spirulum bacteria, a type of spirulum bacteria, which is like uh, yeah. syphilis is a spirulum bacteria. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, uh, but some, some are a uh, part of, you know, a uh, beneficial part of a living soil system, but other ones are um, syphilis. Mm-hmm. So uh, right. <laughs> pretty interesting stuff. You're, you're well advised. Like, let me put it this way. I know it's the more expensive option, but, you would always want to replace with fresh tubing if you can. Sure. Yeah. You got to clean if you're going to reuse. You got to clean oh, yeah. it well. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that's the thing that, like, the high level concept that needs to be taken in is that cleaning has always been seen as Charlie work. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hell yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> right. I, nobody wants to fucking do it. It's the lowest paid position on the totem pole. And, like, the problem is, is that their work directly impacts the financial success of subsequent crops. Yes. Absolutely. And so then you're told these people are told to clean, but they're not told how to clean, what to clean with, and what is the measure of clean. I, I, there's an answer to this, some of this. Number one is that management or whoever's in charge of things needs to develop some SOPs. So you're going to do all that thinking for them so that you can give them a hint. You can just hand them a document that tells them what they're doing, why they're doing it, what they're doing it with, how to do it, and when to have somebody come and check their work. Yes. I love that standard operating procedure, right? There's that. There's also, you know, doing the thinking and understanding that that whoever's purchasing all the cleaning supplies, that they're purchasing cleaning supplies that actually match the things that they're trying to kill. Yep. And that they're applied correctly. So then you're like, well, how do you validate clean? Unfortunately, in, in some cases that requires a lab, right? Where you could take like a contact plate which is basically like a Petri dish where the agar goes all the way up to the top and you press it on a surface and then you send it in. You can do swab sampling of a certain area, like a control area. There's also a device called an ATP monitor. This is kind of a cool one. I actually want to get one for myself. I'm, I'm, wow. I'm wow. So that's incredible. Adenosine triphosphate, the currency of all living organisms. Is that just a yes. way to literally like Star Trek scan a surface for life? Is there any life on this fucking surface? In effect, yes. So the way this device works is, as you just explained, the ATP is is a bioluminescence, is is an electrical, for lack of a better term, is a light that is produced by all living cells. So an ATP device would have like a a stick with a swab on it. You You would run that over a given area. And then you would insert that swab into the device. And what it's doing is it's basically shining some, you know, through some sort of magical process, right? It's <laughs> able to convert the amount of bioluminescence in the sample. Whoa. Yeah. So it converts it to a relative light number. So then what you can do is like then you then you clean and you re-swab the same area. You put it in the ATP monitor and you should have a lower number of bioluminescence, which proves that you cleaned and that you removed living organisms. Jesus Christ. That is really yeah. cool, man. Thank you for sharing that yeah. with us now. But like oh, you yeah. said, I mean, if you just go through the correct processes, you can reliably assume that what you're doing Absolutely. is clean because this is testable and provable. But little things like you said, uh, people for the if you didn't hear la- the last episode with Jason, go back and listen. He talked about isopropyl alcohol. And I was mm-hmm. one of those people who fell victim to the 99% is better. And he explained that the more water is in there, the longer it sticks around and the better it cleans. Again, check out that last episode. But like you, just little stuff like that, man. If you're on your P's mm-hmm. and Q's and you dot your uh, T's and cross your I's, then uh, <laughs> then uh, you'll be you'll be good to go. Yeah. P's and Q's is what is awesome. And what P's and Q's looks like is making sure that you're getting complete contact with the surface, with your cleaning wipes and stuff like that. Making sure that you're respecting corners, pits in the tables, stop having corners and pits, but whatever, whole other discussion. And then the Q's is what are called contact time. Making sure that you're abiding. If you want the result that the, that the manufacturer is claiming, you want to be able to make sure that you're adhering to the contact time. If it says leave wet for 10 minutes, leave it wet for 10 minutes. And if it dries in five, go back and reapply. All right. So those, that's sort of the, the big takeaway, if you will. Dries in five, then reapply. Um, right. <laughs> dude, listen, we're at the top of the hour, but this was an awesome episode. Thank Thanks, you so man, much. Uh, where can people find you and all of your uh, work and, and your projects? 
Well, let's see here. You can, uh, if you want to check out Filter, www.filterscience.com. Uh, we spell it without the E in filter, uh, but I had made sure that they bought the domain. That's F-I-L-T-E-R science. <laughs> like, you got to buy this, guys. I don't want to have to explain this. All totally. <laughs> you, know? uh, you can also check out particle counters and air samplers at uh, www.golighthouse.com. And if you want to check me out for more like microbial contamination control information, that's all I post. There's no nudes. There's no bug shots, unfortunately. No only fans. It's a very dry. It, it's a very dry page, but, you know, you'll learn a lot <laughs> um, and hopefully get a laugh out of it, too, because I love lowbrow humor. It helps the medicine go down. And you can find me on the Instagram at dyslexic stoner 402. That is dyslexic stoner 402. Go and give him a follow, everyone. Thank you so much, Jordan. I appreciate you letting me on again. Thank you, Jason. This is a dope episode, and uh, we'll be sure to have you back real soon. Everybody, give him a follow. Check out Filter and Lighthouse. And I uh, hope you're doing big things out there and keeping those big rooms clean, everybody. Keep it clean. That's all for today. Find us and everything we do at growcastpodcast.com slash action. Get on the green list for free. We're doing giveaways all the time. And we'll see you at a meetup or an event soon. Take care, everybody. This is Jason and Jordan signing off, saying have a great day, be safe, and grow smarter. Be safe, everyone. That's our show. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Before we wrap it up, going to give some love to our newest partner, SD Microbes. SDMicrobeWorks.com, code GROWCAST for 10% off, the highest quality bokashi and compost that you can find. You guys know I love this BioVast compost. We just did the San Diego Living Soil Masterclass, and we got to look at a bunch of BioVast and, more importantly, see the soils that BioVast was built off of, and they were thriving, everybody. BioVast is the best compost that money can buy. It has so many different types of microbes. It's got the biodiversity you need. They identified over 15 different types of nematodes. They identified a whole bunch of varieties of very beneficial microbes, and I can see from the soil samples that it was indeed thriving got a good ratio of all your major soil microbes that you need in a living soil system. It was absolutely incredible to see this stuff under the microscope. Get your BioVast compost and get your Bokashi and much more at sdmicrobeworks.com. Code GROWCAST for 10% off. Add that little boost to your garden, everybody. If you're not happy with your compost, if you're not happy with your living soil, try out BioVast. Um, brew it into some tea. Inoculate your compost with it. BioVast from sdmicrobeworks.com. Code GROWCAST. We love SD microbes. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who came out to that class. It was absolutely incredible. We will see you all in Buffalo in a little over about two weeks. We're going to see you in Buffalo. And you can find all our classes at growcastpodcast.com slash classes. I'll see you on the road, everybody. We got meetups too, so I'll see you there. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Check out those update episodes as I get more clear on my schedule and these monthly meetups. And I hope to see you at a meetup soon so we can blaze one down, you and me. Go do incredible things in your garden. I'll see you next time on the next Growcast. Bye-bye. They basically put like a barbed wire finish line on a race to get to the end of the line.